get this rolling. All right. So today we're going to look at uh, the in detail one application of the forms. That's going to be a pretty much a repeat of one we did with the Fourier transforms. Um, but we're going to see how we adapt that to Z transforms. And in the process, we're going to be reconnecting Fourier VTFT transforms and Z transforms in a way that's going to help us bridge <coughs> from the world of analyzing discrete time systems to actually designing them. And so we're going to make the connection back to Fourier. Look at how we can do steady state responses of systems looking at their transfer function, the H of Z thing, as opposed to the frequency response, H of F. Then look at how we can surmise the, the shape of the frequency response from the pole zero locations of the transfer function. <coughs> doing that with a couple of graphical kind of uh, uh, approaches. And then develop a set of design rules that we can use for designing discrete time filters that have certain frequency characteristics. And with some time left over, hopefully, I'll look at a quick example of putting that practice of doing an actual filter design by placing poles and zeros in interesting locations in the Z domain. So lots to cover there. Lots of applications for Z transforms. All the same ones we could do with Fourier, we can do again with Z transforms. If you want to find the unit sample response of the system, well, instead of solving a difference equation with special initial conditions, probably easier to transform the difference equation. Um, in this case, use a Z transform, rearrange it to H of Z, and take the inverse transform. That's going to be the better way to do it in most cases. We can't do that right now because we need an inverse transform to do that. If we haven't talked about that, that's Wednesday. We want to do system analysis. Finding zero state responses, we can do that with DTFTs. We can do that again with Z transforms. Because we saw we have a convolution property in the Z transform domain that's similar to the, to the Fourier transforms, in that instead of convolving in the time domain, our choice could be to transform the whole thing and multiply them. But again, we have to do an inverse transform to get a time domain answer. So we're going to hold, hold that one until Wednesday. But know that that's coming. Know also that we can do better than we could do with discrete time Fourier transforms. We can find more than just the zero state response when we're using Z transforms. We can find the total response. We can find the zero input response and the zero state response. This is part of the reason we came to Z transforms in the first place. So we've got to put that on hold. What we can do is this problem here. The steady state response to harmonic signals, sines and cosines, those kind of signals. <clears throat> Discrete time versions, so they have a digital frequency and have some magnitude and some phase and some digital frequency. We put that into a system and we want to know what comes out. Well, we can always do convolution. <clears throat> we can do that with transforms. But for this particular case, for just steady state responses, we don't want to do that. We don't want to go through that trouble. That's more, more trouble than it's worth. We have the shortcut method for that, right? When we did it with Fourier, what do, how do we solve this problem with Fourier? I gave a cosine, a particular frequency, we did Fourier transforms. How do we solve that then? What can we use to find the steady state response in a Fourier transforms? response, and if we put in this particular frequency with some magnitude and phase, we knew that what came out was exactly that same thing, that same signal, the same magnitude and phase, and same frequency, except all that the system could do was scale it and shift it. <coughs> How much it scaled it was, well, we had a frequency response that we plugged in the particular frequency we put in, see what the system does to that frequency use that complex value, find its magnitude, and that's how much we scale the amplitude of the input signal. Find the phase of that, and that's how much we add to the phase, existing phase, and that's it. That's the steady state response. So we're looking at what is the system's 
frequency response tell us about what that system's going to do to this particular sine or cosine signal at a particular frequency. Well, <clears throat> that was all well and good and easy. We'd like to do that, but we haven't derived necessarily h of f if we're using z transforms. Um, we've got h of z. And again, this, this whole argument only holds if you don't have aliasing. If you do, then we have, a, have to readjust our frequency to the alias frequency. But <clears throat> we need h of f for this kind of thing, but what we're working with now is h of z. How do we connect those guys? Well, <clears throat> Using as a simple example our recursive filter where we have the one half to the minus one feedback path, we've already derived the difference equation. We actually already know h of n, we've derived h of f, but if we hadn't gone through all that, we just said, here's a system, I want to know how does it behave for a particular input signal. Let's say a three sine pi n plus pi over six. I put this signal into this system, and what's going to come out? <coughs> What's the steady state output? Well, if I hadn't derived the frequency response, we could derive h of z very quickly. Right? <clears throat> well, first of all, what frequency is this? We would set the 2 pi n f argument to pi n and figure out that, oh, that's frequency 1 half. Mm. All right. Would you agree that if I transform the difference <coughs> equation, we have, if we did this example, we would have a z over z minus 1 half? transfer function. We get a 1 minus 1 half z to the minus 1 from the left hand side. We get a 1 on the right hand side. We create the y over z over x. <coughs> we get this quantity. We want positive exponents of z. We'll multiply top and bottom by z and get the z over z minus 1 half. Okay. I don't want to do convolution. So I don't want, can't use this directly. I want to turn this function of z into a function of f. Frequency. How are we going to do that? <clears throat> well, we already had h of f, so we could kind of work backwards and say, well, they look pretty much the same if I just replace z with an e to the plus j2 pi f, then I could do that. But usually we don't have the advantage of already having figured out the frequency response. But that, that substitution is actually correct. If you have a pole zero diagram, which is a description of h of z, the transfer function, maybe we have our pretty contour picture of the magnitude of h versus z. How does that relate to frequency response? How do we get from this kind of view to this kind of view? We know to solve this problem, we want to, we'd like to look at this function, this h of f, this magnitude of phase versus frequency, Evaluate it at a particular frequency, in this case, f equals one half. Pick out these values and apply it to our input signal. But I've got this world, my h of z. <clears throat> so how do we how do we work with this to get this? Well, that substitution that we backwards inferred actually makes a lot of sense. Would you agree this is the discrete time Fourier transform defining summation? And down here we have the defining summation for the z-transform. And if you just, they're identical, if, except um, if we make the substitution z equals e to the plus j2 pi f, take that quantity to the minus n, we have the discrete time for your transform um, definition. And so that is the bridge. That's how we get from z back to f. We replace z in a transfer function with this quantity, e to the plus j2 pi f, and then we have a complex function that's a frequency of, uh, excuse me, a function of frequency, the variable we want. So we basically derive the frequency response from the transfer function by using this substitution. Take your h of z everywhere there's a z, we make it e to the plus j2 pi f, and we have h of f, a periodic repeating frequency response function. heard that a few times, but here we see why that works. Okay. So we want to solve a steady state problem like this. We can do it with h of z. We don't need to define h of f directly. Uh, now, what is that? How do we
we interpret that? I'm replacing z with some value that has some frequency, and this is a, just a real number, is probably between 0 and 1, or minus 1 half and plus 1 half. So this quantity, e to the plus j 2 pi f, is z values that have what magnitude? It's the magnitude of e to the j anything. 1. 1. So this substitution that I'm suggesting here means I'm going to, of all the possible values of z that I have, it, it can be a, any complex value, I'm going to restrict myself to z values that have the form e to the j 2 pi f. I'm going to be something with a magnitude of 1, which means I'm going to be operating somewhere on that thing we call the unit circle. And those are the only points that I'm going to be using. So z is a, each of z transfer function is a much much more, much broader, much more general function. H of f is a particular subset of H of z. It's the H of z when we evaluate it only at z values on the unit circle. And not only that, but the angle that I am from the horizontal, that's the angle argument in my complex exponential. This angle is the frequency, well, 2 pi times the frequency, the digital frequency that I'm at. So, and you tell me I want to work at frequency one half. Well, I'm at two pi times one half or angle pi. I'm over here with a magnitude of one. You tell me I want to be at frequency zero. Well, two pi zero, I'm at angle zero. I'm over here operating at z equals plus one. So we can relate z positions to frequencies or frequencies to z positions. Here being z equals 1 being frequency 0. <coughs> Here at z equals plus j, that's like e to the j pi over 2. <coughs> so that's like, like uh, frequency of 1 quarter. So the 2 pi times a quarter gives me pi over 2. <coughs> and again, over here we have frequency 1 half at z equals minus 1. And frequency either minus a quarter or plus 3 quarters over here at z equals minus j. And it just keeps repeating. So this is frequency 0, 1 half, 3 quarters, 1, 1 and a quarter, 1 and a half, 1 and 3 quarters, 2, 2 and a quarter, and on and on and on, getting that cyclically repeating function. So h of f, the frequency response, is given by the magnitude of phase of h of z as we take on values that are walking around in the circle. And the frequency tells me the angle that I'm at. So when we drew this kind of picture of the contour of the magnitude of h versus all values of z, how we relate the shape of this contour to these two-dimensional frequency response plots, well, the digital frequency axis is mm, this circle <coughs> going around the unit circle. And amplitude is still amplitude, so the vertical directions are the same on the magnitude plot. F equals zero, well that's out here at z equals one, let's get them down here. So we would go out to z equals one in a circle, look up, see how high the rubber sheet is, or the contour right above us, that would, that would associate to the magnitude response at z equals zero. That would be up here. So this should be over here about four, and this says about four. And then tracing out this shape is just moving around the unit, unit circle and keep track of how high is the, is the contour, the h of z contour, as we go around. Right? So as we go around and around, we're tracing out this shape by following the contour of the, of the uh, surface. That's what this, this black line here is a projection. That's the values of the, of the contour at points directly above the unit circles. So that's what we're seeing there. This, this shape down and up is this down and up for the magnitude response. Yeah. So the scale is only from zero to one half. Is that only one half of the unit circle? The That's the upper half of the unit circle. So if I trace out the other part, I have an even symmetric version of this. Is or if I go in the negative <laughs> direction, I do this. Is that always true that it's even symmetric? Yes. If it's a real valued, um, if the impulse response is real valued, 
its transform has to be even symmetric magnitude, odd symmetric phase, both around f equals zero and around f equals one, and the Nyquist. Yeah. Um, so the where the 3D graph is intersecting that plane uh, at those two points, it, those are the zeros, right? Here. Yes. And um, the <coughs> so different picture. All right, sorry. <laughs> but yes, that's that was where there were the zeros were. Yes. Those guys were what were creating that. Yeah. F equals a quarter. A quarter was a quarter way around at ninety degrees on the unit circle. Okay, and. Just looking at it, the the poles are the x's, right? Mm -hmm. So, w how are they significant on the three D graph? Like, are there any defining features on the three D graph where ah. you say there's a pole? Is there any? The pole, the zero is really obvious. So zero on the unit circle is dragging that thing down, and and it's that's easy to spot. What's the effect of the zero? Or between the poles, what's that doing to the contours there? Pushing it up, right? So, uh, so I would argue this pole at z equals zero, not doing much of anything other than pushing up the rubber sheet in the middle. Uh, oh, it's like infinitely increasing. Yeah, right? but this one out here, that's kind of pushing up the rubber sheet on this side, yeah. the real axis. I don't have something doing that on the other side. So I'm thinking that's kind of making my part up here higher than the part over here. Okay, so it's giving me more boost, more gain on these low frequencies than I have up here at high frequencies. So you're getting it. This is ex so we can actually tailor the shape. We can create frequency response shapes by moving around poles and zeros in the, in the Z plane. And today we're going to develop the rules for doing that. Absolutely, that's what we're after. We can move to designing stuff. And, and it's actually the first valid way to design digital filters is by placing pole zeros intelligently in the z-plane. Um, turns out it's not the best way. It's, it's seat of the pants, it's intuitive, you play with it, you, you, know, you tweak it till it's close and right. There are more, more scripted, more deterministic ways to do it that we usually employ. But for some kinds of filters, this works great. Right. So, so yes, this created something of a low-pass filter, not great. By put, dropping some zeros, we made sure we had perfect, perfect attenuation here. By bringing a pole out here, we had this give us some gain there. Now, not a great filter. I mean, if we're true low-pass, we want this to be down. I want to do some more things to it. But we're, we're beginning to see that connection of poles and zeros shaped to frequency responses. So you're on the right track there. Okay. So our simple minded example, if we have h of z instead of h of f, we know what frequency we want. We could solve this problem. You don't have to slide the list. You may have to actually write something down. Um, the z we're going to use is e to the plus j 2 pi times the frequency we want, which is 1 half. So we're operating e to the j 2 pi times 1 half or e to the j pi. So we're up there, up in top of the unit circle, which has to, or, you know, we're all the way around at z equals minus 1. So instead of deriving h of f and plugging in f equals 1 half, we can take h of z and plug in z equals minus 1. Same thing. And get the magnitude and phase of the response. So it turns out if you do that, replace z in here with minus 1. At minus 1 over minus 1 minus a half, which happens to be 1 over 3 halves or 2 thirds. And <clears throat> I guess we'll have to bring the lights up to see the board. And the answer to our quest we said if you give me x of n is 3 sine <coughs> pi n plus pi over 6. <coughs> And then the steady state output for that is going to be that same signal. Now scale by the magnitude of h of z at z equals minus 1, 
which happened to be two thirds from there, and add to it the angle of H of Z, evaluated it, and replaced Z with minus one, that happened to be zero, and voila, answer. We said the value we want for z for frequency f that was one half is e to the j two pi times that frequency. That's e to the j two pi times a half, or e to the j pi. E to the j pi is like well, angle pi. That's over here. This point at z equals minus one. Okay, so it's an analogous way to do steady state frequency response without invoking the frequency domain with using the Z transform the transform function directly and just substituting in the appropriate value. Make a sense? How are we doing? Okay. All right. Now I want to build on this connection between Z's and <coughs> circles and frequency response. <coughs> so as we've seen, if you put some poles and zeros near the unit circle, they're going to have a strong effect on the shape of the frequency response, the magnitude response, as we're moving around the unit circle. So we've seen that any time you put a zero on the unit circle, well, at that frequency, we're going to have a we're going to have a null, a zero in the magnitude response. This one over here at z equals minus one happens to be, well, some example we had here, that's f equals one half, that's the Nyquist break. So at f equals plus one half and f equals minus one half, we have a zero. And by putting a pole at zero and a zero out there, we can make a low-pass filter. Not a very good one, but there's a low-pass filter. This one actually also happens to be an FIR filter, a linear phase low-pass filter, which is kind of nice. And we'll see what rules we have to apply to get that. Yeah. Why isn't there a zero at uh, minus five? Why a, a frequency of minus five? At minus or point five, sorry. There is. Here's frequency oh. minus a half. The beauty of a circle. <laughs> and again, this is a symmetric thing. This goes in here and then goes over here and then goes up here and goes over there. And there. So on and so on. And so again, we can relate the, mang the poles and zero locations. The poles are pushing up our contour, the zeros are pulling it down. So zeros attenuate, the poles push up, and the closer we get to the unit circle, the stronger their effects. Where if we put a zero right on the unit circle, then we will make an actual perfect attenuation at that point. And the DC value is what's happening on this rubber sheet or this contour as we look up above z equals 1, which in this case is kind of maximum there. If I bring those zeros over here to this side, <coughs> even double them up, <coughs> then I get a ball shape this way with a 0 at f equals 0, which is z equals 1. And rising on the other side, I'm making a high pass filter. So I don't have anything over here pulling down the rubber sheet so it's let go up, up to wherever it wants to. Uh, here's when I've got a couple poles and zeros right along the real axis and how it affects the contour. Odd shaped thing. But if I look here at z equals one, at frequency which is PC, the closest thing near to me is a zero, so I'm getting kind of pulled down there. It's an attenuated action. They come around over here to f equals 1. Well, the closest thing I see is a pole pushing things up. So our magnitude response is much higher over there. These two guys in the middle, eh, what are they doing? Not a lot. <laughs> this 0 at z equals 0 is not really doing anything. This pole's that's eh, pushing up the sheet. So what's that going to do to me? That means that's part of why this this over here doesn't go all the way down to zero. If I didn't have that pole there, probably would dip down lower. But this guy's kind of pushing up the contour a bit. 
the closer I get these two together, the less effect they're going to have. They're like they're canceling each other out. So you've got this real rapid down up. Not going to do affect much what's going on on the unit circle. Yeah. Um, so the distance from the uh, unit circle that like kind of affects how much it changes the graph. Like if it's further out, then like it has more of an effect. Yes. And hold that thought. In a two slides, we're going to see why. Okay. Question. Can you go back to the previous one that you just showed? This yeah. One? Why wouldn't at like positive or um, you know how you have two these guys two poles? Yeah. Um, or actually, not. I got it. You got it. Okay. Yeah. Good. That's the kind of question. All right. Let's make some more connections. <coughs> so to your well, was in one slide. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> so we can use distances from the poles and zeros to the unit circle to tell us a lot about the magnitude. It'll tell us actually exact values for the magnitude and phase of the frequency response. And it's a similar kind of thing that you may have done in 228, looking at distance from operating points on the J omega axis, just that now we're on the unit circle. Thinking is, if you've got a transfer function h of z that you factor in the poles and zeros, and we want to know what's the magnitude and phase of this probably complex ratio. Well, the magnitude of that would be, well, we know the magnitude of the numerator divided by the magnitude of the denominator multiplied by any scale factor we have out in front. And each of these zero terms are multiplied together, so we would multiply their individual magnitudes. Each of these whole terms would, be, would get their individual magnitudes multiplied together in order to create the magnitude ratio. And this, these quantities, z minus z1, z minus z2, I can interpret these as vector distances in the z-plane from some point, choose a point, z, to z1, or to z2, or to p1, or to p2. These are vector distances. And so if I want to know what's the frequency response at some particular frequency, f0, well, I would turn that frequency into a z position by replacing z with e to the j2 pi f0. And that'll place me somewhere in the unit circle. So let's say here. If I want to know what's the magnitude response of the system at that frequency, I'm going to do this. I'm going to draw vectors from every pole to that point, every zero to that point. And the magnitude of the frequency response so this frequency, which means I'm operating at this z value, is nothing more than any constant out in front multiplied by the product of all the distances from all the zeros that I have to the point that I'm operating these red lines divided by the product of all the distances from any poles that I have to that point. Here I just have one of each. And that will give me actually an exact numeric value for the frequency response. So relating that back to your question, that says, well, if I get closer to a zero when I'm coming around the unit circle, I'm going to get a small vector distance in the numerator. The numerator is going to start getting smaller. The magnitude is going to start getting smaller. If I get closer to a pole, say I have a pole out here, as I get closer to that, I have a vector distance in the denominator that's getting smaller. It's in the denominator, which makes my function get bigger. So the lengths of those different vectors are what are affecting the shape of the magnitude response. As I get closer to zeros, it goes down. As I get closer to poles, it goes up. And it's the relative rates at which we get closer and further away from poles and zeros that affects the shape. Similarly, we can also get the angle at a particular frequency by going to the right position and measuring all the draw pictures, draw pictures, all the angles from all the zeros, add up all of them, and subtract off all the angles from the poles. Because the angle of a complex ratio is the angle of the numerator minus the angle of the denominator. And if each of these terms is complex and we're multiplying them, we just add their phases. 
And we would take all these denominator terms and add their phases and subtract the top from the bottom. So if we find the angles from all the zeros, subtract the angles from all the poles, ta-da, that would be the angle of H of F at that frequency. So here's a better example. I've got two poles, two zeros. Let's see how this would work. And let's say, here's my um, operating frequency F0, which puts me at Z equals E to J 2 pi F0. So I'm up here at this point on the inner circle. And I want to know, what's the magnitude and phase of the frequency response when I'm operating here? Well, <coughs> for the magnitude, we would take any multiply our constant k, multiply it by the distance from the, from the uh, zeros. That would be this distance from z1 to that point, the red line here, and the distance from this pole, zero, to that point, magnitude of the vector z2. Those are in the numerator. In the denominator, we take the product of the distances from the poles, the vector from p1, that magnitude, multiplied by the vector from P2, that magnitude. Similarly, we take the sum of the angles from the zeros, that angle, this theta from zero, 01, that theta from zero, 02, subtract off the sum of the angles from the poles, phi of P1 and phi of P2, and get that. Let's see how that works. Numeric example is better. Let's do a real, let's do one of those some numbers. So here's a, uh, I got two, one, one, zero, two poles. My poles are a complex conjugate pair on the, the imaginary axis. I have a zero at z equals plus one. So here's my pole zero diagram. Now I don't know, what's the magnitude and phase of this guy f equals a quarter? <coughs> well, but now we're seeing that f equals a quarter. We plug in e to j two pi times a quarter. E to j pi over 2, that's up here at 90 degrees. So here's where I'm operating at z equals plus j. The magnitude response, well, <coughs> is, well, I have uh, one zero, this guy over here. So in the numerator, I'm going to take the distance from here to there, from 1 to j, which is over 1, up 1, or square root of 2. The hypotenuse. And I'm going to divide that by the distance from this pole, which is just a half, multiplied by the distance from this pole, one and a half. And where do I get the k from? Well, there's my k. So we plug in k equals 2, and you would have the actual value of h of f at f equals a quarter. <coughs> then for angles, we need the sum of the angles from the zeros. Well, there's only one zero, so I only have one angle. It happens to be, well, it's a 45 degree angle this way, so it's 135 degrees from the horizontal. That's my theta z1, it's 135 degrees. The angle from p1, we always measure from the horizontal, that's 90 degrees. Angle from p2 is also 90 degrees. So we'll subtract off 2 times 90 degrees and get an angle minus 45. And that should be the same answer I get is if I plug in, where am I, plus j for z in this, in this quantity up here. All right, see how to do that? So again, this, I mean, it's a way to graphically get the values of h of f at any frequency. It's more helpful for, as we were trying to do, seeing how getting close through two and further away from poles and zeros affects the magnitude response of the system and maybe the phase response. Okay. So let's look at it that way. Yeah. Is there any reason you leave the <coughs> Uh, I should have here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it would be in the plug in case for that. Questions? All right. So let's take our let's take our simple example there. And looks like we're gonna need some lights to see it. <laughs> 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 
All right, we already know what the answer is going to be. All right, what's our cold frame diagram look like for this guy again? Where do I have a zero? Where's my zeros? It's equal zero. Where's my poles? Equals plus one half. And where am I operating? At f equals one half. Plus j two pi times a half. Plus j pi. I'm over here at minus one. So let's get some vectors in here. So I've got a vector from the zero to that point like that. And I've got a vector from the pole over here like that. And my magnitude of h of z at z equals minus one is going to be, <coughs> let's see, do I have any k factor? No k out in front. equals one. And what's the magnitude of the vector from the zero? That looks like one. And what's the magnitude of the vector from the pole? That looks three. like three halves. Clear, I like that. Same answer. And the angle of H, that same value. Well, it's 180 degrees minus 180 degrees. It's equal zero. It's the same thing we got over here. So, simple example, but we could have used it in a more complicated one. So we can do it graphically, we can do it analytically, we can do it with h of f, we can do it with h of z, lots of different ways to get the thing, get the same answer. More importantly from my standpoint is, I want you to start seeing, as you're starting to do, how pole and zero locations in the z-plane are affecting the shape of the frequency response. So we saw, you put a zero in the unit circle, boom, h of f goes to zero at that point. If I get close to a zero, then it's still going to be attenuated. The closer I get, the more attenuation I get. Here's a classic cone filter. It's called a cone filter because its magnitude response looks like the teeth of the cone. If they're equally spaced, we equally space around the perimeter on the unit circle a bunch of zeros. If we want no DC response, we'll put one at f equals zero. And wherever we, or wherever we want a notch, uh, an attenuation point, We'll put a zero at that location on even circle. So some pattern like that is creating this sort of shape, of frequency response. If we put a pole in a unit circle, can't do that if it's a causal system, right? Because then, well, if the magnitude of H of Z is the product of the angles from the zeros product of those divided by the product of the, the uh, distances from the poles. If I put a pole on a unit circle, I have a zero here, and I get a magnitude that goes to infinity. So can't do that. If I put a pole close to the unit circle, then I have a teeny tiny value here in the denominator, which makes h of f or h of z blow up. So getting close to poles pushes up our h of, h of z, or h of f. So we cause magnitude increases as we get closer to their locations because those denominator terms are getting small. So for example here, I've got a zero out here at z equals zero. I've got two poles out here. And as I come around the unit circle, my denominator terms get really small there. And I get these peaks in the frequency response. So we have those now. So kind of like a bandpass filter. Now, not a really good one. Most bandpass filters, you want them to taper off to zero. How can I make this taper off to zero at DC? 
I want this one to go down here to zero. I would need to add my value. Go to zero with 180 degrees. Go to zero where? On the unit circle 180 degrees. On the unit circle here? Yes. Uh, I'll pretend that'll drag me down to zero here at 0.5, oh, oh, oh. which is yeah, good. I like that. That's what, yeah. Okay. And if I want to drag down DC, I'll put a zero over here. So we put two more zeros there and there, and I got a nice bandpass filter. If I move those out closer and just push them out along the same radius, what does that do? Well, it gets more gain and a little bit narrower. <coughs> If I put a polar zero at the origin, it's equal zero has no effect whatsoever on the shape. Because <laughs> put something here, we're dividing, multiplying or dividing by the magnitude of this vector length. It's either in the numerator or denominator, but it's not changing anywhere around the unit circle. So it has no effect other than maybe an overall pushing up or pushing down. It affects every frequency. If you want an FIR filter. All of your poles have to be at z equals zero. Or you don't have an FIR filter. If we transform this, the Kevin's equation of a FIR filter, it only has x terms, so we don't have numerator terms. We have negative exponents. So when I turn it into a transfer function of positive polynomial coefficients or, or exponents, we're going to end up multiplying by some power of z, which is going to end up giving me some poles at z equals zero. So FIR filters do have poles. They just live, all have to live at zero. That's also why FIR filters are bulletproof stable. To be stable, their poles have to be inside the unit circle. Well, they're all at zero. They're any, anywhere near the unit circle, and they're definitely inside. So you can't make an unstable FIR filter. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Can IIR filters have all their poles at zero? Uh, no. And as soon as I move a pole off of zero, I think I have an IIR response. Okay. If you put a pole in zero at the same place, it's as if they weren't there. Right? Because we have the same numerator and denominator factor as with any fraction, we could cancel them out. So if I have a pole and a zero at the same location, it's as if they weren't there. <laughs> Which is actually a clever technique that we can use in discrete time systems. If you have a nasty pole you don't like, like out here, making the system unstable, you add <coughs> some terms to put drop a zero on top of it, and it's not there anymore. And that's a game you can play with discrete time systems because we're just talking about mathematical equations in a computer or piece of digital hardware. If I do that with double precision numbers, I can hit that location exactly. You give me an analog filter, I gotta get 0.001% capacitors and resistors to do that, which don't exist. Yeah. Can you have two poles or two zeros in the same location? You could. And then does that just increase like the slope or like the yes. gain? It, it, effect, it like effectively doubles the effect. Okay. Yep. All right. If you want a causal system, the number of poles you have has to be greater than or equal to the number of zeros you have. If you have more zeros than poles, then your H of Z is going to have a higher order polynomial in the numerator than the denominator. When you convert it <coughs> to a difference equation, and normalize it back to be y of n in terms of other terms, you're going to end up with a non-causal term. You have to. So we need a lower order, the same or lower order polynomial in the numerator of A to Z that we have in the denominator. That's another way of saying I need more poles, at least as many poles as I have zeros, to have a causal system. And if we want a stable system, we know it's causal. You have to have all the poles inside the unit circle if it's causal. That's the region of convergence to include the inner circle. If you want real coefficients in your difference equation, which we <coughs> usually do, this is the time domain equation that describes the system. We have real coefficients in our x of n, y of n minus 2 terms, 
We want real value coefficients. What that means for poles and zeros is if I have a complex polar zero, I have to have their complex conjugates. I have to, they have to come in conjugate pairs. Right? So if I have this particular zero, I've got to have its complex conjugate as well. Or else I'm going to get an imaginary function. When I have their complex conjugates, when I put them together, multiply them together, the complex, the J term, the imaginary terms, cancel each other out. And we need just purely real terms. And if you want a linear phase FIR filter, which we say didn't like, because they have a have, uh, non-distorting phase, if it's FIR, all my poles have to be at C equals zero. And here's the weird thing. If I have a polar zero that's not at zero, at some radius r, I have to have another one at the reciprocal of that radius, one over r, where r is usually less than one. So, <clears throat> well, that's why I can't have FIR filters that meet this, because I, mean, I can't have IIR filters. If I have a pole out here, and I need the reciprocal one, that would give me a pole outside in the circle, which would be unstable. <clears throat> if you have complex conjugate zeros, this is weird, I have to have not just complex conjugates, I need reciprocal radius one zeros paired with each of these guys as well, so I need complex conjugate reciprocal radius quadruples. Yeah. If you have a pole at zero, yeah, um, pole at zero, and you're trying to make it on your phase, is there a way to do that? You, it has to. All of your poles have to be at zero. Yeah, when your phase filter. Okay. Because okay. And 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 any zeros you have have to obey these rules. Yes. I'm saying if there's one at zero, you obviously can't put one at you know one over zero. Right. There would be an opinion. So if it's at zero, that's okay. That that that, that, that is okay. Now, similar to that. If I have a zero on the unit circle, it's already at its own reciprocal radius. Because one over one is one. So I am allowed to have single zeros as long as they're on the unit circle, but if they're complex, I still need to conjugate on the unit circle. Lots of rules. Okay. Ah. And if you want what we call a minimum phase system, that's a system that has the least amount of phase. Um, in its frequency response, I need my zeros to be inside the unit circle. Because notice if I have a zero outside the unit circle and I'm adding, figuring out what the angle term is to some point on the unit circle, I've got these huge angles to every point on the unit circle. Really big angles. So if I want minim to minimize the phase, I've got to bring those inside. Okay. And if you want really high Q filters, either very narrow notch filters or very high Q band pass filters with narrow transitions. Well, if I, want a, if I want a comb filter, I can put those zeros on the unit circle and knock out some frequencies. If I want a narrow band filter, though, what I'll do is put a, put a pole behind it on the same radius at the same angle. And the closer I get that, that pole to the unit circle, the sharper the transition gets. So, for example, here's, here I've got a zero here and zero here. That's making that a little notch here. It's a pretty gentle notch, slow, slow transition. I put a radius of being slower by my, my pole of zero. Here's a pole of radius of 0.6, and that makes it about that wide. Let me move that out to 0.9. You can see how it sharpens that up. 0 0.6, 0 0.9. So the closer we get that pole to the zero, the narrower this notch gets. Can't get it all the way out there, because it'll cancel it. And I definitely don't want to pull on the circle. And we don't have time for the example. We'll try to run that first thing on Wednesday. Talk through a quick design example, and then we'll get into some more inverse transforming to open up some other analytical techniques. See you then.